helpful in your development on the spiritual path. Also, Alice Bailey claims not to have written those books herself. She is only a medium. And this is very difficult to understand for many people at this point of development in yoga. But she is receiving messages from a person who is called Tibetan. And she is simply putting that down in words. And I can tell you those, those analyses that she, make, she makes in her books are very, very interesting and very helpful in understanding the world and understanding the development of humankind. It is, not a, it is not based upon races. It is not based upon prejudice. It goes far beyond that. And it is based upon how the human being, according to yoga philosophy, is constructed. We are constructed out of energies and emotions. We have intellect and we have spiritual body. And she is analyzing the world based upon that framework. back to it again later on, constructively. Um, and this brings us to the issue of stealing or theft, which is subject for today. I received also an email uh, with a file containing the book Light on Yoga. And I considered sending it to all of you. But the book was copied simply copied on a copy machine and put on a PDF file. And it was found on a file sharing site. So that infringes copyright. This is a very interesting issue because the world is moving when it comes to internet very fast, when it comes to intellectual property rights as well. We have to not become fanatic or radical in our approach of things, also not in our approach to yoga, you will see. I'm a very controversial teacher because there are many paradoxes that I will show you that are existing in yoga and in the <coughs> world. The world is changing very fast because of the internet. You can see what is happening. Revolution, spreading, but there also information is spreading, and some of that information, according to the old ways of doing things, according to the old laws, belongs to somebody, and that person deserves to get paid. We have had libraries over the ages, over the millennia even, we have had libraries, and libraries, in fact, are institutionalized infringes, infringers of intellectual property right, but as a sensible human being, as a common sense human being, you could argue, of course, that many people develop intellectually as a result of their access to libraries. Same with the internet. Music companies, publishers of music and books, and newspapers also, have long resisted their material out on the internet because they see their revenues plunging, they lose money, and they, of course, appealed to the laws on intellectual property rights. But they are turning around now. They are trying to slowly catch up with the internet and there are other ways to make money, to get their money, to get their share, while users of the internet have access to their information. Sometimes paid, sometimes not. 
but you can download music. <coughs> you can download uh, uh, books also. <coughs> some is free and some you have to pay for. Now the file sharing site, if you find that file sharing site and you download something from there, in my opinion, I think you are not doing anything wrong. But that is a gray area. But if I receive that file taken from a file sharing site, and I'm going to distribute it, it's my school, you pay for the course, so it's commercial, and I'm going to distribute it to 28 students in my class, then I'm very clearly stealing in that case. So I decided not to forward the link. This brings us back to Alice Bailey, because Alice Bailey, the, her books, she has, I think she has 24 books she had. She's, she's not alive anymore, obviously. Um, her books are being published by, the, uh, by Lucy's Publishing Company, which is a non-profit uh, organization that wants to share all that wisdom over the world and very slowly, kind of underground movement, very slowly, it is spreading. And these days it is even being translated into Korean. There are people working on it, those books being translated in Korean. But they are already published in many other languages. If you search the internet a little bit, you will see that they are there in German, in, in, in Dutch, in French, in Italian, in Japanese, in, in, in many languages those books are available. In all those countries there are groups springing up that support that goal for non-profit out of ideological reasons, simply because those books elevate humankind and help humankind to evolve even faster towards spirituality, towards the divine. And so Alice Bailey's books, there are libraries online, internet libraries, where you can have access to all those books and it's legal. It is with the agreement of the Lucy's Publishing Company which is part of the Theosophic Society. Have you ever heard of Theosophic Society? Mm -hmm. Theosophic Society, I think, origins from India, is purely based upon the spiritual, or is purely focused on spiritual development of humankind in its entirety. And they do that for naught. They do that not for profit, for commercial gain, but really with an idealistic goal of helping humankind fit for commercial gain, but really with an idealistic goal of helping humankind. So those books, this library, I can forward to you, and you can use it freely, without infringing copyrights. There is another issue. Um, it is proven that people who download music often want to have the CD anyway. People who download a book eventually want to buy the book anyway, to have just the physical material book or CD. So in that sense, the, the panic reactions of the publishers of music and books is totally based upon fear of losing something, but actually they gain in the end. You have seen the same situation with the development of Korean economy. Korean economy was very hostile towards foreign products, very closed very strict regulated, but they exported enormous amounts of goods. But as a result, Korean economy kind of got stuck at a certain level, they developed very fast, at a certain level they just got stuck. Then they opened up. When I came to Korea 14 years ago there were no foreign cars at all. Only if you go to Itaewon, people from the 8th Army in Yongsan, they were driving around in, in mostly American but also European cars. Now the streets are full of European cars and the supermarkets are full of European American products. When I came here, there was nothing in the supermarkets. You can't believe it if you were not here 14 years ago. There was nothing, only Korean products. Now it's full. It's full of uh, import products. And as a result of opening up, the economy is again booming incredibly. 
And you see this happening all over the world. China is booming. Why? Because they opened up. Brazil is booming because they opened up. And so everybody, there's an incredible synergy occurring. Everybody starts to create more and more harmony. We talked about harmony on a personal level. Harmony is occurring and spreading more and more. If you look at what is happening in the Middle East, that is all process of this purification process. There are people who don't understand exactly how all this process is working, and they are, they are accusing America, the United States, of having kept those military dictatorships alive. But that was only a transition period. People don't understand that if 40 years ago Egypt would have had a democracy, it would have become one big chaos. People were not ready yet. Now, with the support of the United States, I'm not a promoter of the United States, but I want to put things into perspective, with the help of the United States, those people have had 30 or 40 years to educate themselves, to become more aware, and now it's time for revolution, and that is what is happening. You see? Same happened in South America. Many of those countries uh, were military dictatorships. Some of them still are, but they are prospering now. They have been military dictatorships by, by necessity as a transformation period. A couple of decades, people evolve intellectually, spiritually. They become wiser, stronger, independent, and then it's time for revolution. That is what happened. And so the country starts to thrive on world level. Economies start to uh, flourish. People start to flourish. Emancipation is occurring. Liberation, emancipation. The levels of um, medical care are improving, increasing. <coughs> Education is increasing. So everybody is getting better from it. In Holland, you have this leftist movement that is, that is criticizing America for everything, forgetting that we were liberated by the Americans, whole of Europe were liberated by the... We would be speaking German or Russian if not for the Allied troops that came to rescue. Simple as that. But people, people's vision is blurred and they just they think about America as evil and, and, and they think of the black operation, the black ops. Those things are necessary. Evil. Otherwise it's impossible. You understand a little bit? You can criticize me for what I'm telling you, but that is a little bit my vision of... Why I'm telling you this is because there is a movement going on in the whole world of which we are part of evolution. People are evolving at an incredibly rapid pace. Can you see that? There's a lot of positive... And surely it always comes together with some negative things. Sure, you can't avoid that. But the tendency is positive. The tendency is towards more and more freedom, more and more emancipation of the human spirit. Look what is happening. Also in Africa. In Africa, it was unthinkable a couple of years ago that some of the countries would unite and stand together to oppose one of the other rulers. Exactly that has happened recently with the ECOWAS, opposing... Uh, Mr. Lauren Kobakbo in Ivory Coast and trying to get him out actually before they would have supported him and so even there you now see forces for the good standing up uniting and all for the same goal prosperity for everybody freedom, democracy for everybody can you see that? Yoga is part of that. The books of Alice Bailey are part of that. You can see the books of Alice Bailey as a kind of uh, Freemasons movement. <clears throat> the books of Alice Bailey are spread to help humankind elevate itself from lower <laughs> instincts and emotions to higher spiritual values. A difficult books to read, but marvelous. 
if you just take your time, read a couple of pages per day and contemplate on it, let it settle down. Marvelous. Well, we will come back to this later, for sure. So this, this of course, is uh, related to theft also, the, our today's issue. The practice of satya. <coughs> when you talk about non-stealing, it is obvious that when you take an apple from the grocery store, without paying, that is theft. Everybody knows that. However, in your practice of yoga, and I think we should start there because that is the most practically applicable to your, to your practice also. In the practice of yoga, you have to be realistic about your practice and how you approach to your practice also. In the practice of yoga, you have to be realistic about your practice and how you approach it and what you can do also. If you force yourself to do exercises that you are not actually ready yet for, you are violating all the principles. You are being violent to yourself because you hurt yourself as a result of that. This is important for you also. You, you hurt yourself as a result of that. So nonviolence stands at the basis of everything. But it's also a lie because you are denying your limitations. So in that sense, it is also a lie if you, if you try to do exercises. It is good when you try exercises that are difficult if you do that with the right mindset, which means that it is a playful experiment. But if you are contorted with seriousness, and, and you have to do it and you force yourself into a pretzel or whatever other difficult form you are trying to copy, causing all kinds of pain, and often people end up with torn muscles, then you are violating all those principles. Sadly, this is the way yoga is very often practiced because it has become a purely physical engagement. But to benefit from yoga and also to install sattva, harmony, we have to work with those guidelines. They are guidelines for us to reach more and more harmony, peace of mind, comfort, and also development. Because at the basis, sattva lies at the basis of all development, as I explained last week with the comparison of how children grow up. Children who grow up in a very stable, peaceful environment, they prosper and they grow into very stable, mature adults. They prosper in school, they are at the top of the rankings in school, they have good social relationship, etc. Children who grow up in, in very unstable environment and stable families, they stay behind in their development in all aspects, intellectually, in school, socially, emotionally, everything stays behind. But I'm telling you this to emphasize the importance or even just so you understand how much influence harmony in you can have upon your further life from now on. It may seem far away or unrealistic, but I have gone through that whole process. I am in fact from a very unstable family and I have created a very stable environment for myself through the practice of yoga, so I'm, I, I became wise through experiment and experience. So I have a lot to share in that sense also. And you can always contact me if you have a struggle with something or aspect of your yoga practice or another aspect of your life or relationships. Do you have questions about the subject of theft? Or non-theft actually, <coughs> non-stealing? <coughs> Other question is also okay, sattva or Shiva and Shakti. Uh, last week I wanted to ask you about expectations. Yeah. And kind of how that comes into play with um, expectations Good question. With satya, I guess. 
Well, look, when you have expectations, I'm a yoga teacher. I too have to work alongside those lines. First of all, if you look at the yamas, non-violence, non-truthfulness, non-stealing, honesty, uh, chastity, non-desire, they are natural laws. I am not telling you anything new when I talk about this, because in your heart you already know it. All I'm doing is bringing it to your attention, into your awareness, so that you can consciously do something with it in a constructive way and apl start applying it into your life. So you build a framework onto which you can match your life. That leads to very incredible uh, insights and possibly changes also in people's lives. I know that. As a teacher, of course, I would be very happy if you can put both your feet behind your head and stand on your hands and wiggle back and forward like a real yogi. I would be very proud. You know, my chest would swell and ooh. But that is, of course, an expectation that if I let that expectation rule my way of teaching, you will get hurt. In the same way, there are many English teachers here. Of course, you would like your students to excel, to be good at what they are doing, to pick up as much from what you are teaching. But if your expectation is high and you start hitting them with a stick to increase their performance, then you are on the wrong track because as a result, the child will be, will block, the intellect of the child will be blocked because of fear, because of the pressure to be perfect. So in that sense also, that is, that is stealing. So it is good to have expectations. This is what I meant with paradox. There are many paradoxes in yoga because there is no absolute in yoga, in life. There is, if we talk about something in this way, uh, that is not good, then would the other thing be good? No, the, the truth always lies somewhere in the middle. And the approach simply is based upon common sense, which unfortunately is not so very common. <laughs> but more and more common sense, I think, is spreading throughout the world. So, yeah, expectation, but you can apply this in your way, in your uh, handling other people, or students, or maybe family members. Uh, parents are also very demanding of their children because they want their children to excel, to be perfect. Um, but if you understand how it works and how it actually blocks people from developing, into uh, balanced uh, beings in general, then you have to, uh, you have to um, control your desire to let children or other people um, perform to your expectations. But you have to start in the first place with yourself. Start with yourself. If you, you, you can go out here and walk around the gym or in the street or in your neighborhood or back home or wherever, and you look at people's faces, you can see there are people who are perfectionists. Perfectionists are always very tense people. They're very scared to make a mistake, and when they do, they will always deny it. And the worst thing is that if they deny it to other people, Okay, that is in the beginning, that's not so important yet. They deny it to themselves where many people meditate. Crime rates go down. That has been shown in statistics. In Holland, you have those villages of Osho in the past, Bhagwan. You have Zen, Zen societies, Zen, Zen groups who have their own small villages within a village or within some <coughs> community. And there harmony from their spiritual practices is spreading throughout the environment around them. So it is said, that based upon this research, it is said that if only one in a hundred people in the world would practice meditation, there wouldn't be war anymore. There wouldn't be violence anymore. Influence is that big. That is why the school is called Magic Pond. That is the magic pond. The world is a magic pond. 
you throw in a stone of positive energy and it spreads. <coughs> Surely if you throw in a stone of negative energy, that spreads too. So we have, as spiritual people, we have a responsibility in that sense, a duty even. That is the duty also that Lucy's publishing company is fulfilling by spreading those books. You had a question also? Um, yeah. Um, where is the author Alice Bailey from? I think she's American. No, she's from England. England. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I had another question too. Um, it's about Shakti and Shiva. Yeah. Um, you know, some people are more Shiva, some people are more Shakti. Um, I was wondering if if you're one, if you're more of one than the other, is that something you're supposed to try to balance, or is that something you accept as being like? No. Okay. I told you before that yoga is the science of control of life. So you don't accept anything anymore from now on. Yes? Again, a paradox here because just before I said you have to accept everything your limitations and this and that and try not to be perfectionist. But, but yoga leads to you becoming a master, a real master. That means that you, a master controls things. The science of yoga is a science of life, but it's a science of the control of life. And in the beginning, that just limits itself to trying to stand still in a pose, physically. And you do that, again, by concentrating mentally, which leads eventually to mentally standing still. But this is very difficult, and you have to have a lot of practice there. But this control will spread more and more into all other aspects of your life. If you look at Buddhist philosophy and yoga philosophy also, it is all saying that life is suffering. You know, Buddhists, when a baby is born, they mourn, they cry. Because another life has started the whole path of suffering. And they have a party, they put on white clothes and flowers and happy music when somebody is, has died and is being uh, buried or burnt usually, they, they are happy. Why? Because the wheel of suffering has ended there. So life is suffering. Why is life be considered to be suffering? There's a long story, but I will try to tell you this in short a little bit. Life is considered to be suffering because human beings find themselves all the time in circumstances that they don't want to be in. But because we, don't, we are lacking the insight, we are lacking the experience, we are lacking uh, intuition, mainly, we find ourselves in those situations all the time before we know it. And so we are always busy in our lives trying to clean up the mess behind us, trying to put things right that were wrong because of the circumstances that we ended up in. We end up in those circumstances not only because of lack of insight and wisdom, intu in intuition, but because our emotions and desires, lower emotions and desires, constantly put us in situations that we regret, that cause us to struggle. And that is the suffering that is talked about in Buddhism and yoga. There is a way to end that suffering, and that is Try learning to control. But how do you do that? How can you prevent situations from developing, undesirable situations that you don't want to be in? How do you stop that from happening? That is in the first place by developing insight. So life is just a play. By the practice of yoga, because you are constantly doing attempts to stand still, you develop an incredible sensitivity, you will see. Within a couple of months in this course, you will be much more sensitive than now. All your senses will become more sensitive. So your touch, your, your eyes, your ears, but more importantly, your sixth sense also develops more and more. So you will become very sensitive to everything that is happening into your environment. 
in the beginning that can make you more unstable than you already are. It sounds strange, eh? Yoga is supposed to make you more stable. But the beginning stage, it can make you, or some people, more unstable than you already are. That is a stage that you have to go through, and in that sense also the Alice Bailey books are very helpful to help you understand all this. That is a period that you have to go through to go to a higher level, to the next level. As a result of your increased sensitivity, you become very itchy about things around you, energies around you. And everything is energy. A situation that is developing is energy. Because we are blunted, our intuition is not working, functioning properly, we are distracted by all kinds of gross issues. We are concerned about, we are concerned about what we look like. We are concerned about uh, money. We are concerned about our career and those kind of things, the friends that we are going out with. But because we are so concerned with all kinds of outer, outer things, outer interests, we have lost touch with the refined things in life with intuition. When you become more and more refined again in your intuition, in your sensitivity, you will start seeing things, and I say seeing with between, how do you call these things, Quote, quotation marks, because you are seeing with your sixth sense, with your third eye, intuition, you are feeling things. And as a normal human being, let me say normal. As a normal human being, you don't see situations developing until you're normal. As a normal human being, you don't see situations developing until you are in the middle of it and it's too late to withdraw. That is a generalization. It doesn't work like that, of course, black and white, but in general. As a supersensitive human being, which you probably already are, otherwise you wouldn't be here in this class, as a supersensitive human being, you will be more and more skillful at detecting the seed of a potential situation before it has started to develop. But the seed is there, and you feel that. And because of that awareness, you can decide, you can choose whether you let that happen or not. So if you feel there is a potential danger there for a situation developing that will cause trouble, that will cause misery, suffering, then you just choose not to, you, you, you choose to turn around and go another way. This is, this process that I'm describing here, that is called karma yoga. Karma yoga is the highest stage of yoga. That is, when you have gone through all the stages of development in yoga, you have, you have purified the karma behind you from all the mistakes in the past. You have cleaned it up, more or less, mentally. But you have also developed the ability to see karma developing, because we talk about situation, but situation, you end up in situation as a result of your energies. You attract other energies coming to you. So as a result of that, you have not only cleaned up karma behind you, but you also avoid it from developing in the future. And that is eventually where we want to go. So we stop the suffering, the cycle of suffering and, and, and misery. So we can focus on constructive things. People who go through this stage become very focused on what is really important in their lives. So they become very good at the work that they do. They are very harmonious in dealing with their family. Very, very efficient you become as a result of this. Because you avoid all the distractions, all that energy being sucked out of you from these situations all the time occurring and having to deal with them and cleaning them up again. Yeah? But th this is something that you will slowly and certainly grow towards. It is for this reason also that I tell you so much about yoga. Because this is not a basic course. It is very advanced. If I put that on the website, then nobody will come. But you are all, you are hungry for this. I know that. Just like I was hungry before. I give you everything I have, and even more if I can, in the short period that we are together. That is a very 
complicated explanation to the Shiva and Shakti issue, but you, you don't accept things anymore as they are. You, yeah, for the sake of harmony, you accept things as they are, but little by little, you start to take your life into your own hands, not anymore being controlled by circumstances. When it comes to Shiva and Shakti, if you assess that you have a very Shiva uh, constitution, you know that that is not a good condition. So you try to do what you can to slowly but certainly correct that condition. In yoga philosophy, like in, other, like in religion, we talk about a downfall. The downfall is going into that Shiva domination. That is, a, that is a, a negative cycle going down into Shiva domination. That is a long story again. I will, we will come back to that later. But our Shiva condition, Tamas condition of most people, is a result of that downfall. And as a master, you can turn it around by doing the right things, by doing exercise, <coughs> by uh, energy control, and by simply avoiding things that make you tamas, that cause tamas condition. Food causes a tamas condition, depending on the food that you eat. Too much sleep can cause tamas condition. Working too hard also can cause a tamas condition. So there are all kinds of adjustments that we have to make in life, which during this course I will let you know about which things they are. But you can, you can, if you feel that you have, you are one of those people with the tamas condition, we most have, one way or another, to some extent or very large extent, you can choose to just not accept that tamas condition anymore. Because if you contemplate on it, you will see that this tamas condition is the reason for many of the things that you don't agree with. That has been my struggle for many years. But if you are patient and you just continue to walk that path, suddenly one day you will sit here and smile, stupid smile. Why? Because everything has all the pieces of the puzzle fall into place and everything is okay from that moment on. You had a question, Michelle? Um, so as you were in, in as you go on in life, you know, you are sometimes presented with situations, circumstances, or people that you do sense can be um, taxing, you know, where it's, it's difficult to deal with it, but yeah. then you would you say that sometimes it'd be wise to take on that challenge in order for you to develop? Yes. And how do you discern As whether or not a given situation is kind of a productive or a constructive challenge or that is that is not I cannot give you a recipe for that. That is something that you have to learn by trial and error. Yeah? That is why life, you have, in life you just have to play, also with difficult situations, especially with difficult situations. You learn from that. So that question I cannot answer. You have, every individual has to um, answer that question for himself. No, as a yogi, you know, most people, um, most of the decisions that we make in life are based on fear. If you look carefully at everything that you do and think and decide, it's always there is fear involved. And so many times, because we sense a certain fear, we decide not to do something. We go challenges out of the way. A yogi picks up the towel or the glove. You never go out of the way of challenges anymore and you do not let your life be ruled by fear anymore. But saying that in this way, then you can ask, yeah, but how do I avoid that? Well, that is something that will slowly develop in you because one of the characteristics of spiritual people is they are not only quiet and observing, but they are also 
most of the times they are very fearless. If you look at observing, but they are also, most of the times they are very fearless. If you look at uh, uh, hero stories from throughout history, often talking about uh, uh, heroic deeds and, and, and people sacrificing even their lives, there's usually that is not big hooks that take up the challenge, but it's usually very small, quiet, spiritual people who are, who are just utterly fearless and um, do not go out of the way of, of, of challenges and do not let their uh, lives be, be paralyzed by, by fears. Yeah? Because fear is, is totally paralyzing. It stops all development. <coughs> But you will see as a result of your practice that you will automatically become more courageous. As a result of yoga practice, you know, when, when you read yoga books about all the stages that exist in yoga, all the kind of different kinds of yoga, there are no different kinds of yoga. They're all stages of development you go through. And you go through those stages naturally. You don't have to say, okay, from today I will start bhakti yoga or karma yoga or this or that kind of yoga. No, you just have to practice. Continue to install harmony in you. Become stronger. Generate more, larger amounts and, and better quality of energy as a result of your practice. And then all these stages you will automatically go through with time. And fearlessness is one of the developments that will take place as a result of it. And I have experienced going through all these stages without theoretical backup, and that caused a lot of instability, emotional instability and, and doubt. That's why I'm mentioning the books of Alice Bailey, um, because they were very instrumental for me to understand the finishing touch of yoga, and doing a course like this with my teacher in Holland um, was the start of the process of starting to understand all the developments that I went through when I practiced alone. So the theory will help you to understand. As a result of understanding what is happening with you, you will not have to be in doubt for so many years as I was, unstable. You, you, your development will go much faster. That's what I told last week about the difference between Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga. It is said that with Raja Yoga, practice of Raja Yoga, you develop, you reach enlightenment in three years. Raja Yoga is the study of the whole science of yoga. But with the practice of Hatha Yoga, it will take you 12 years because Hatha Yoga is generally... Uh, focused on physical practice without discussing all the theories and philosophies that lie at the basis of yoga. Our course is a Raja Yoga course in fact and I'm, I'm giving you much more than I sensibly should but that is because I'm very passionate about giving you as much as possible for the finish of this course. Because we live in an expat community, most of you are expats, your time is limited here, so I'll give you everything I have, I can. If you get a headache, if you become dizzy because of everything I'm throwing at you, just let me know. <coughs> Many of the things I mentioned will be explained again from another point of view. It will come back again, so things will become clearer. You don't have to understand everything from the outset. Just soak it up. And during the weekdays, you will see that you automatically start contemplating on those issues, and they will start to make sense. So just let it go. Do not worry. And if you really have a question, you can always write me an email, or you can call me. I prefer that you write, or ask next time in class.
Other questions? Yeah? yeah. Um, Thomas? What do uh, yogis consider God to be? Because I, I was reading the light on yoga, and I know Buddhists are usually atheists, or they don't. Um, yeah, I, I just didn't understand. Yeah, good. <clears throat> I, I don't like to use the word God in the first place. Because the image that people then have in their mind is so limited. There is no God in yoga. There is no God in Buddhism either. So uh, there are people who claim that yoga, yoga no, the Buddhism and Hinduism also are not religions simply for the reason that there is no God. They have many deities. There, there are many deities. But they are actually purely, they are not religions. However, they are practiced as religions with the, the deities being worshipped and many, many rituals. God in yoga is everything. You are God, I am God. This wall is God. The, the tree outside, energy, because everything is energy. Look, you don't hear me talking about God on purpose because many of the people who try to lecture about yoga, they constantly fall back into talking about God and divinity and the spirit and the soul and all kinds of things that you cannot do anything constructively with if you don't understand what it is about. For me, for me, Every person will have the same feeling of what God is when you just have the time to sit down, be totally, totally quiet, and just be. Then you start to feel energy. You start to become aware of energy. Instead of God, I like to use the word higher power. The higher powers. Because... There is, a, there is a coherence in the universe. Coherence? Yeah? Good. There is a coherence in the universe that you find back on all levels. Also on the individual level, but also if you would just extract one cell from your body, there is that coherence. That coherence is present in the whole universe, and everything has a reason. Everything has a logic, although that is not always easy to see. And everything is coherent with, with each other. Not only has a logic, although that is not always easy to see. And everything is coherent with, with each other. Not only here on Earth, but in our solar system, in our Milky Way galaxy, in all those galaxies among each other, there is a coherence. Everything is, everything is uh, related to each other and working together with each other. And that energy that is pervading everything, in my eyes, when yoga books use the word God, that is what God means for me, personally. But I think many yogis will agree with this. And religiosity is something that every person can feel when you become quiet, when you meditate, when you are in silence. And when you have had such experience, you will start to laugh at what is going on in the world of religion. One religion saying to the other that my religion, my God is better than your God. My God is superior to your God, so I am allowed to hack, to chop off your head. There are religious conflicts in the world that are because of this. Because my God is better than your God. But no matter where you come from, whether it's a small island in the South Pacific or a uh, hustling and bustling city in Asia or from Amsterdam or Berlin, everybody, wherever you come from, if you sit down and be quiet, you have the same feeling. You have the same feeling of that, that divinity. We all carry a little part of that divinity within us. We, so I don't like to use the word God 
When you talk about the word God, then we, we think about something that is superior to us and it's sitting there up on a cloud with a large beard, white hair, and when you commit a sin, then it will throw thunder and lightning at you or something like that. That, that, is, um, that is the way people looked at it hundreds of years ago. If you read the Old Testament, you will see that, uh, that uh, God was used as a form of state of governing a large group of people. You organize them by fear. And very interesting, I, I think it is, I, I stand above it in a way, but I can see what is happening around me. Um, Christianity or Catholicism was introduced into Korea also. And maybe this is also interesting to see how trust works, because we are talking about trust as well. What you can see now after uh, Christian, Christian communities, Catholic communities being developing in Korea for the last hundred years, is that uh, people unite. And as a result, they have a harmony among themselves. Um, they trust each other. And based upon that trust, those people are successful in their lives, in their business, as compared to those people who are not part of those groups. Have you seen this? That is the reality in Korea. People who attend church, um, they do a little bit what we do, but on another, from another, coming into it from another corner, but it is, it is, it is uh, um, creating harmony, not only individually, but also on a group scale. And um, if, you, if you look at countries that are very poor, the main reason for that, that is there is no trust. Everybody is mistrusting everybody, and so nothing can be done. If you look at old Europe, Western Europe, Northern Europe, there is a lot of trust there. There is enormous trust there among people. People shake hands with each other and they believe each other, and people keep their word. And so those countries in, in that part of Europe, for, for decades, have been thriving, for, not for decades, for ages already, for centuries, have been thriving. So he, I'm telling you this because you can compare this with our goal in yoga to create harmony, first on individual level, is having the same effect. That harmony will lead to the same kind of development that you can see with a country where there is trust and where there is peace and no conflict. It's exactly the same with a human being. If there is peace, harmony, no conflict in you, you will start to thrive. Like the wealthy countries in the world that are thriving. They are thriving because of this. The countries that are poor, they are poor because of there is constant conflict, nobody is trusting anybody, people live in fear, and their development stays behind. They have no room for development. And when we started this class, I talked about uh, what is happening in the Middle East and so on. You see this hap countries that find a certain stability, everybody starts to benefit from that. All individual citizens of that country will gradually start to benefit from that. That harmony reflects on those people, those people build families, and that harmony is spreading and every start to pros everybody starts to prosper. The whole country starts to prosper. Yeah? Say again? The disharmony in the United States, you think that's causing some of the problems with maybe the economy and politically? Disharmony in the United States. Yes, there is disharmony in every country, also in Holland. But, you know, there are people who feel a lot of resentment towards the United States because it is a superpower. And so they wish they would just go away. Dutch people do so. I read the newspaper, and leftist people in Dutch, they are very anti-American. Yeah? But, but if, you look, if you just look at the world, you know the, the play, the risk? 
there, there is a game called Risk, in which you try to conquer parts of the world. America is playing that game. And if it were not for the fleets of America being positioned here and there in the oceans, other powers would take over and we would go back to the Middle Ages. That is my opinion. And America is using uh, some hard, strong, strong arm tactics here and there, and they have their black operations, but they are sometimes necessary. And they're very ugly, and I agree with that. But the overall picture that I'm seeing is a picture of good. Even while, huh? even while people are suffering because of it? That is an intermediate stage. In, in South America, in the Middle East, people have been oppressed by military dictatorships. But there was no other way. There had to be a, mil there had to be a military dictatorship for, for a while to allow people to grow towards democracy. If you would have given them democracy, both Canadians, Americans, and of course Americans, they were very uh, widely uh, uh, present here. So, after the war was over, there was a United Nations presence here to keep peace. As a result of that peace, the country developed very fast with a lot of help and a lot of aid, uh, economically and, and uh, in terms of medical uh, care and education, and, and etc. Look at what, Amer what Korea has become now. It is, a, it is a powerhouse of democracy and freedom. Yep, if you think in a negative way, you can see some negative things still. There is still some oppression and there is still some... Yes, but you have to look at the whole picture. And America is playing that game of risk, of course. You can look at it in that way. But Korea has democratized and people are, people are as a result, they have, most of them have outgrown the suffering of their parents and grandparents. So you, sometimes suffering is necessary to, to lead to a purification and build upon that. There's a difference between saying sometimes suffering is necessary and sometimes inflicting suffering is necessary. <laughs> yeah, uh, of course. Why do you say that? Just this idea of collateral damage and saying, well, it's a necessary phase that we have to go through. Yeah, but that is not fair. Look at what is happening in Afghanistan. I, I Really, I don't like to talk about politics, but look at what is happening in Afghanistan. The, most people die because of bombs from their own people. Yeah? Um, the allied forces that are there are, of course there was collateral damage before, but they are so careful that even when their own men are in danger these days, they choose not to bomb because they are afraid to bomb local population. They are so careful, they are not there to cause collateral damage. They are there to bring... Look at Afghanistan, that land is, that land is in the Middle Ages. Girls are not allowed to go to school. They are being circumcised or... Um, people have no freedom, women are oppressed, men are still living in the Middle Ages. Europe and America and all the other countries that are in Afghanistan are trying to bring enlightenment there. That's an easy example, but what about the headscarf in France, for example? Do you know what I mean? Yes, but... In, in terms of cultural imperialism. Okay, what you see in Holland, and also in France and Germany, is that all the Moroccan and Arabian people that came to, uh, to Europe, most of them were not wearing headscarves when they came. And when you go to uh, Istanbul or Rabat or Marrakesh, women are free and liberated. The mo now it has become a political issue and women, simply out of protest or because their husband forces them, they wear a headscarf. They are more fanatic and more... Uh, uh, radical than their family at home. So they are that is a kind of a provocation. But this is also a necessary step in development. Their children and their children's children, just look what is happening there, you have to look into the future. What is happening now is a consequence of something else. So you just have to let that go, let it fizzle out. 
If you resist it, what is happening now, if you resist it, it will only become stronger. That is where the radicalization of people comes from. But resist what? Resist the uh, urge to stop people from wearing a headscarf or resist the urge to modernize and to not wear it? You cannot for the more you try to force them not to wear the headscarf, the more they will want to wear it. That is just how it works. So you have to let them go. But you can, of course, if you don't want people to wear a headscarf in school, in class, in the classroom, you can impose that maybe. There are women who wear burqa. People cannot be identified in that way. There could be a man in that, that burqa with a Kalashnikov, and he could walk into an airport or a bank or I don't know where and cause a lot of damage. So in that sense, people have to be, it must be possible to identify. It's all a matter of common sense. How far do you go? How far do you allow it to be, and how far do you let it go? Sometimes you have to step in, but you have to be very careful. I think European governments are very prudent in that sense, to a certain extent, but it is, it is going out of hand. And all over Europe you can see that the right is becoming more strong, as opposed to the left, who has allowed everything to go out of hand. The reality, the truth lies in the middle somewhere. The solution lies in the middle somewhere. They are working on it very hard. But please try to see what is happening. Is all leading to more light, more peace. And sometimes there are some ugly things that are part, but that is part of the process. When you start, when you start going towards the light, you also have to deal with ugly things from your past. And in doing so, you sometimes also end up with violence because you are not there yet. That is, that, is, that is a motion movement going on in life. But people who are on the path like we are, they are not going this way, but they are going and they're going more and more up. And the swings between tamas and rajas, the duality, become less and less. Think of some of your favorite examples of paradoxes to share. Oh, we will come across paradoxes. If you ask me to bring up one now, I can't. But we will come across many paradoxes. Life is a paradox. Shiva and Shakti in itself is a paradox. <coughs> okay, I think we have to start. Do you have any other questions? related to this or okay. or during the subway ride or sitting in a park enjoying the sunshine and a nice sandwich or so I hope also that you have started hearing it during the exercises especially after the exercise when you stand in Tadasana and you let your energy spread. Nada. Everybody hears Nada, right? That's amazing. In most classes there's always a couple of people who don't hear it. So congratulations on that. Um, this is your head. are buzzing with activity. You're maybe not aware of that, but now that we are sitting here trying to be silent, now you start to notice that you have so many thoughts you were not aware of before. And if you pay attention to it, you will see that actually most of them are totally useless. Not constructive. So every thought that you have is in fact energy that you are it's like turning on the well now the air conditioner is on it's turning on the heater turn up the heater to 10 and at the same time you open all the windows 
So it's a very inefficient way to handle your energy. That is how most people function. So one of the one of the ideas behind yoga is to start becoming efficient, to insulate the house, close the windows, so that you start so that you stop wasting large amounts of energy. Every thought is energy. How do you know? Well, you probably have persons around you in family or family circles who have something happening in their life, something stressful. <coughs> People who are full of worry are always exhausted. They do nothing all day, but simply the fact that they worry, simply the fact that they have constant mental engagement makes people totally exhausted, even more than physical activity. So it, it's better to have thoughts that are not related to worry or doubt, so better not to have negative thoughts, but in the first place we have to become aware of this all at first. So with every thought that you have, you are losing energy, you are wasting <coughs> energy. In the beginning, that is impossible to stop that. But try, first of all, try to observe that flow of thoughts taking place. This is the first step towards meditation. So that is, for us, at this stage, that is the most important thing to do. Simply observe. So nothing difficult, nothing strenuous. Just sit and simply be and try to observe that flow of thoughts happening. If you feel that you have room, you can slowly start guiding the energy, transforming the energy. How do you do that? Bring it back. Bring it back. To where? To where? Bring it back to nada. Bring it back to nada. If you can hear nada, the moment that you are aware of that whole flow of thoughts walking away with you, simply remember nada. Go back to nada. If you focus on nada, if you have already the ability, the power to concentrate, as long as you are focused, there is no thought escaping you. But that is very difficult to be totally silent, have no thoughts, that is almost inhuman. But at least we can start slowly, gradually, and gently also, with the process of reducing those, this river of thoughts. And you do that every time that you have um, opportunity to sit down and just be quiet. And here we do this deliberately, we take deliberately time for that. Every time you have an opportunity to sit down, and you simply turn your attention inwards and you feel all these thoughts going crazy and you transform that, you bring it back to nada and we do this only 15 minutes today but you will see 15 minutes is a long time with many many thoughts so you will have to do this like maybe a couple of hundred times in only 15 minutes. But the last thing you must do is become frustrated. When you become aware of this enormous flow of thoughts, that's already bad enough. Then you try to curb that energy from escaping you. You might become frustrated because you realize that it's almost impossible. If you become frustrated, you only make this worse negative energy, more loss of energy. So try to be light-hearted and like a little child, take the little child by the hand and guide it to where you want it to be. A little child is like this. It's full of energy and it is running left and right and back and forward and oh look at this and oh look at that and oh. The parent is the control system and it takes its hand. If you do that gently, the child will obey more likely than when you become rough and, and start to scold and the child will become more rebellious. Same. 
So be gentle, be nice, take the child by the hand, and just bring it back to Nada every time again. No frustration, no irritation, no worry, just like very even-minded, very even-minded attitude, calm, just bring it back. If it doesn't work anymore, if, you, if it does drive you crazy, then you drop it. Just observe only. At this stage, only observing is enough. It's already a big task in itself. Yeah? Can you do that? It is depending on so many factors. It depends on so many factors. We will come to that. Yeah. Yoga scriptures teach you how you can make certain adjustments in life without practicing yoga, how you can make certain adjustments in life to create more harmony or to avoid tamas. We will come to that when we start reading the Hatha Yoga Pradipika. Yeah? But if you say, you know, the, the, the thing in the first class here last week, I already told you that you must really be a courageous person to actually uh, go into something like this. Because it requires a lot of courage to face all the obstacles that are on people's road, on people's path. Most people just conveniently ignore all that. And that is, if you say, yeah, well, you know, I was just born like this and it's just so and I don't have to do anything to change that. That is, that is, of course, very convenient and very comfortable, but if you are the least bit uh, uh, rebellious, you will just not accept that. But that means that you will have to deal in the beginning with many obstacles to eventually make life, of course, much better and more in line with what you really feel in your heart, but you will have to overcome those obstacles. If you don't, you live just a very mediocre life, which is very comfortable for many people. But I assume that the reason that you came here is that you don't accept that, and that you want to also take charge of your life and anything <coughs> related to it. Hmm? It was just a, a question related to what you were saying. We were <coughs> sorry, Stephen. Yeah. No. <coughs> Um, we were having a discussion over lunch last week and we were kind of, we were just voicing a fear that we have maybe that if we, if we kind of achieve like perfect harmony, then like facets of our personality would just go out the window. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, how do you, yeah, what do you think about that? <laughs> no, do I look stoic? <laughs> no, no. Look, you will, as a result of this whole process, you will slowly but certainly get rid of certain uh, aspects of you which were superficial in the first place. That's why you will get rid of them. You will get rid of them in a very natural way. You just lose interest in certain aspects that you've always been interested in. But you get so much in return. So it's not that you're like, yeah, as a joke, I haven't done this in this class, but Maybe you have heard about it. As a joke, I, I sometimes say that you become very boring yogi, insipid. That is in the eyes of other people. But your life will just start focusing on other aspects, more, more real instead of superficial. We live in a superficial world. The, the, the age that we live in is unprecedented in the history of, of the of the existence of the earth, billions of years. There's so much materialism, but on the, on the, same, on the same hand, also, um, 
as a result of the material wealth that we have created, people are very stable in large parts of the world, and as a result of that, people have evolved very fast intellectually and spiritually also. So there's a good side and a bad side. People who lose themselves into the material world, um, which you have a lot, of course, surrounding us, people who cannot handle the wealth of the material world we live in, yeah, they, they get lost, but hopefully they learn from it, like we also learn from it. We didn't come here just today flying in from the sky. We all have our path in life, and we all have had our uh, distractions and, and obstacles that we have overcome. And I have overcome a lot of obstacles to get, to get where I am at this point. Huge obstacles that for other people have not been... Uh, other people have, in my family, other people have not been able to overcome. So, yes, but you will, you will not be a con, a boy. <laughs> <laughs> you will not. It's just your interest will shift to more, more internal <coughs> and more uh, based upon your increasing sensitivity. And because you become less restless, you will run around less than you used to like a chicken without a head, as we say in Holland. When you sit down and be quiet like this, do you notice how many times you actually want to stand up and do something? Yeah. That is because there is a little man in your head with a hammer that's constantly hammering, saying, oh, shouldn't you send a message to this and that person? Or sh how about, oh, lunchtime, it's almost lunchtime, what am I going to eat? And, Pay attention that when you have thought such thoughts, your body starts to, it wants to move, it wants to get up and do something. That is why when we do asana, we take this process consciously, and so we stand in tadasana and we say, fix asana. And you visualize the pose, and you do exactly the same what is happening involuntarily. You try to make your body do it spontaneously without having to do it in a forcible way. But when you sit down like this 20 minutes today, it's a little bit long because last week we did only 10 minutes. When you sit down like this, you must notice that every movement you make is instigated in the mind. Restless thoughts. So people who are always busy doing things, even when they don't have obligations, work is finished, family obligations, everything finished, they're still keeping themselves busy all the time with this or that. That is an indication of how restless they are in the mind. As a yogi, you will develop more and more peace of mind, and as a result, you will be less running around like a chicken, like a headless chicken. Because there is no inclination, there is no tendency created in the, in the mind that tells you, how about this, how about <coughs> this, shouldn't you, and oh, 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 and, oh, oh I forgot something, and that's how many people function, and therefore always busy. So, in that sense, I'm, I'm a boring yogi, because I do very little, actually. Yoga is my life, 24 hours a day. And I have a dog, I walk my dog on the riverside, and I work on my uh, upgrading the yoga files and, and uh, reading some books, keeping the yoga school running. And that's all I do, and I don't feel any inclination to, to go out to eat that one and, and go dancing or, or drinking or that I don't have anymore. I don't feel that restlessness anymore. So in that sense, I'm, I'm insipid, maybe. But very nice. <laughs> very nice. Compared to 20 years ago, there's a difference between day and night, I think. 20, 20, before I started practicing yoga. Absolutely. That's heaven. In the yoga scriptures, this is called paradise. That is what you can expect in return for losing your interest in certain superficial things. Heaven and hell, you know, that is not something that occurs <coughs> after you die because you behaved well, you will end up in heaven. And because you behaved badly, you will end up in hell. Heaven and hell are here and most people are living in hell. That is the suffering that in Christianity is called heaven and hell. hell. In Buddhism it's called suffering. People live in misery. It's the same. So if you make adjustments into your life and, and, and you, you respect the, the moral principles and 
you are striving again and again for sattva in your life, you will see your life will turn into heaven, what is called heaven. Nirvana in, in Buddhism. That is just that sense of, of there are no conflicts anymore. There are no... Um, there, there will be less and less distractions. You start slowly to control your tendencies and your emotions and all those things that usually disturb people. That is the purpose of yoga. It's late again, so let's have lunch. And let's be back by...